Hello, everyone. I'm Jim Garrison. In the spirit of the trees, in the spirit of all of living nature, in gratitude for our ancestors, I want to welcome all of you to this session of Humanity Rising. Uh, today is the fifth day of our five-day program on regenerative health in a climate-changing world. So over the last uh, uh, several days, we've been looking at what healing means. Uh, we've been looking at what regenerative health means. We've been noting uh, through a variety of speakers that as we contemplate uh, regenerative health, it's really a remembering back to the wisdom of our indigenous ancestors, uh, because this kind of uh, spiritual awareness has been with humanity for a very, very long time, uh, but has strangely been forgotten uh, in our pursuit of scientific uh, modernity. Uh, and as the world is crashing down upon us with COVID, with the invasion of Ukraine and various other crises that are besetting uh, the human family, literally all over the world, uh, there is a great remembering of uh, the wisdom that uh, used to be uh, available and present in societies and now needs to be uh, recovered. So it's in that spirit I want to welcome you today. And uh, I don't know whether this is a worldwide uh, holiday coming up or commemoration, but in the United States and in a number of countries, uh, it's going to be Mother's Day on Sunday. So it's very appropriate that today uh, in part in honor of that, that we'll be concentrating on motherhood and babies and children and youth and how we can apply uh, regenerative health uh, models uh, to their well-being. I want to now welcome uh, Stephanie Mines, uh, who is a neuroscientist who's written a number of books on this domain, has a specialty in trauma, uh, and has been a supporter of Humanity Rising and has convened a number of sessions uh, on uh, regenerative health and is the convener of this five-day session. So, uh, uh, Stephanie, I really want to thank you for the extraordinary array of brilliance that you've assembled this week, and I'm sure uh, today will be no exception. Uh, and in that spirit, I turn the program over to you. Thank you, Jim. It's wonderful to collaborate with you and with the Humanity Rising team. I do want to acknowledge Humanity Rising and Ubiquity University as a place of unification. And the platform that you've provided that is available to everyone is precious, absolutely precious. And I know that you always selflessly reflect back that generosity to us, but right now I wanna invite you to hold it and just receive uh, the real gratitude that I feel for what you have created, what you have manifested. Thank you. Thank you so much, thank you. So today, dear friends, dear global community, is the final day in the summit on regenerative health for a climate changing world. We are ending really where it all began. My inspiration, my chutzpah, you might say, to launch regenerative health for a climate changing world comes out of my motherhood comes out of my grandmotherhood and my devotion to being a steward for children, for youth, and for the children of the future. I'd like to begin with a somatic invocation. And as Jim said, in honor of motherhood, every aspect of motherhood, do you know that on your very flesh, there are sites that will bring forward your mammalian limbic motherhood, whether you identify as male or female, that quality, that neurochemistry of stewarding of motherhood. 
And Peter, if you don't mind, perhaps you could just close your video for the moment and we'll bring you on shortly. Thank you so much. So on the chest, if you let your fingertips first find the base of your clavicle, the collarbones, there's a knobby, uh, almost midline area, and just find that place. And then let your fingertips slide down and you'll find these more spongy interstitial areas. So keep sliding from the first to the second and then to the third interstitial area, that kind of spongy cartilaginous connective tissue and let your fingertips rest there. You could also just allow the palms of your hands to rest there. It's a field. This is the field of motherhood, the field of mammalian limbic entrainment, compassion, heart opening, that through the contact with our fingertips, the very top of our fingertips or the center of the palms of our hands allows us to draw forward, to bring forward the limbic mammalian connectivity that unifies all of us, the global family. So softening your joints, feeling how the soles of your feet, whether directly or through a visualization, are in contact with the flesh of the earth. Feel the four corners of your feet spreading in that sensuous relationship that we all have with the mother, the earth as our mother, letting the shoulders drop and the face soften. Let's allow ourselves to receive the breath of life in our own natural rhythmic way and become aware of how breath deepens. And if it's easy for you, allow the out breath, the exhalation, to be twice as long as the inhalation as we drop down and let go to awaken to the motherhood that lives within all of us and that feels the response ability to our children born and unborn now in a world in crisis. Please, let's take a few moments and enter our own realms of motherhood. And if you like, you can bring the pads of all your fingers and the palms of your hands together at the level of your heart with a slight pressure, not much. In the energy medicine tradition that I am so fortunate to have apprenticed in, this is called an inju. It is a posture, a mudra, you might say, of alignment and heart opening alignment through the heart opening that is the essence of motherhood. And integrating that limbic mammalian compassionate care that lives in all of us into the very cells of your body where it's familiar, where you remember. The word remember has woven itself throughout this entire summit, not at my request, but organically. That word keeps returning. Remember, bring back into the members of your body the truth of who we are. And we, the adults in the room, my friends, we have the response ability to be stewards 
for the earth, for all creatures, for the children born and unborn, for the youth who we know are struggling. We will speak to that. And this is an action-oriented summit. While we have graciously rested in the invocations of our generous indigenous friends who share so thoroughly their gifts, their wisdom, without hesitation, we have rested in their invocations, in their attunement to the earth and the alignment that we have with the earth. We are not alone in being responsible for the children. But my orientation throughout is action. And by action, I mean love in action. I mean acting as we are guided somatically, deeply, spiritually, intelligently. And for me, intelligence is embryonic intelligence, original brilliance to do what needs to be done now. And as my beloved Hermanas, my sisters yesterday said, it's actually simple. It's right here. It's in our bodies. I offer regenerative health for a climate changing world, a paradigm to help those who feel so called through the heart to attune, to be of service in community. I offer that paradigm and you have been offered multiple options throughout this summit for how you can act. You feel drawn as you are and you can follow those who we have had here. You're all intelligent, wonderful people. You can find them. You don't need links necessarily. You know their names. You can find them on the internet. That's one of the gifts of the internet, just seek and you will find. And today I would like to begin with my most honored colleague. There really are no words for me to introduce Ibu Robin Lim, but I will do my best to say she is a a midwife, a Filipina, Micronesian, grandmother and mother. Ibu Robin Lim has transformed the trauma of the loss of her sister into compassionate service to humanity. In her sister's name, she has created such loving blessings for mothers and babies throughout the world. She has created Bumi Sehat in Indonesia, a sister center in the Philippines, her homeland. She is a lighthouse of compassionate service and following, following the guidance undaunted. That made her a CNN hero when she served mothers in labor, young mothers, little babies during the horrific tsunami in Indonesia. I would like her, if she feels so called, to speak to that because that grounded capacity to follow your vision in the midst of catastrophe is what we all need to learn. I would like to welcome into the center of this circle, the center of the universe, Ibu Robin Lim. Selamat, selamat malam. It's very late here in Bali, Indonesia. And uh, not sure where to begin. I could begin with, uh, with, Stephanie has asked me to maybe begin with a prayer. 
the way that we greet babies at Bumi Sehat, we have four locations in Indonesia and two in the Philippines. And the way that we greet babies wherever they're born is with a song or prayer. So we don't, um, we don't yell at the mothers to push or encourage them um, with words so much as with song. And so I will try not to make it rain by singing to you, but I'll begin um, with a Filipino prayer that we say to babies as they're crowning in the Philippines, just as they're entering our world. Alleluia, alleluia. We got in mo puna kicking a co sayo manga salita. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. And here in Bali, we sing uh, the Gayatri Mantra Om Bur Bwa Swaha Datsa Vitur Warenyam. Margo de washedinahim yo yo na prachodaya. So those are the way that we greet children as they're landing on our earth, hopefully with gentle landings as gently as possible with as much respect uh, to honor the mothers. And that what we've found over many, many, uh, many, many climate change driven disasters is that that it's not only possible, but it's it's really essential that we remember, that we go back to our most um, grounded, rooted ways of welcoming children into the world. Because when you are doing that in an environment where the hospitals have been destroyed, where the infrastructure no longer exists, where you're, you may be you may be receiving a baby by the side of the road in the rain, you may be receiving a baby in a tent. Um, wherever we wherever we set up in our, it's possible to help mothers um, during this these climate crisis uh, disasters. Then we do that. I think the best I feel the best way to begin is maybe to share with you some photos. Is that George? Are you going to do that, or is it Jim? Will you turn on my my PowerPoint? Thank you. Okay, so this is birth in the era of climate crisis. This was uh, between 2017 and 2019, our Gunung Agung, our volcano here in Bali was in an eruption phase. And um, um, it was quite dramatic and quite uh, frightening and exciting, but I thought I would begin with that. Uh, it's peaceful right now, so I can, I can tell you that it has calmed down. Okay, next slide. Okay. Kapuako Mahalko, my beloved humans, I love you. And I begin with that because as a Filipina, it's really important to always begin with love. It's part of, uh, it's part of our culture. It's how I was raised by my uh, Filipino family, particularly my grandmother, who was a, um, a Hilot, traditional healer and midwife, a baby catcher in the Philippines before, during, and after World War II. Um, she really was a beautiful example for how you can take care of people no matter what. You can see on the uh, side there, that bit of green is the Southern half of the Philippines. And that is the super typhoon high end, which in the Philippines we called Yolanda. And um, anyway, let's go to the next slide. So we do know that the surface temperature is increasing, our oceans are getting warmer and warmer, storms are getting bigger and more frequent, drought, heat waves, cyclones, unpredictable weather, snow, famine, strife, earthquakes, also fueled by global warming because the Earth's crust is on the move when it's uh, too warm. Um, there are at least five times as many disasters as there were in the 1970s today in our world. And uh, it's something to think about. Um, and how do we prepare ourselves to be helpful and useful and, um, and wonderful during this time of climate crisis? How do we uh, find our authentic selves and move forward 
as people helping people in, and when communities go through devastation. Okay, next slide. This is in the aftermath of Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines. Uh, this was actually outside of the hardest hit area. So you can see what was happening on the ground and how terrifying that must have been. Uh, fortunately, when it is a storm um, in the Philippines, the people have gotten really, really, um, really good at moving away from the coastlines and going to the places where they're instructed to shelter because, because this particular typhoon, not enough people moved quickly enough. And so there was a lot more fatalities. Uh, for example, in December, we had a devastating storm in the Philippines with far fewer fatalities, terrible loss of infrastructure for the people, um, homes, everything you can imagine. But you can see here that this, this typhoon, we were, they, people were caught unawares. Um, they didn't believe it would be so big. Okay, next slide. So um, Bumi Sehat teamed with Bada Foundation. We also worked with on the ground local uh, people like the Rotaries and the churches, um, the survivors, uh, and those people that um, in any way they could, could help us. And since we do live on the purpose of climate change, um, we will see communities devastated wherever we are. And how do we uh, get prepared for this kind of devastation. Okay, next slide. So Bumi Sehat has been an early responder, the organization that I was a founder of. We've been early responders uh, to many disasters. We had, um, in Bali, Indonesia, we had um, terrorist bombings in 2002. Um, of course, he, we're here, our mothership um, clinic and and uh, community health and education center is here in Bali. And from here, we work with all six centers. We were in Aceh after the 9.3 earthquake and tsunami, uh, which happened in 2004. We got there three weeks before the Red Cross because we were inside Indonesia, we could move quickly. Um, Padang, Indonesia, 26. Jakarta earthquake, 2008. Jakmil, Haiti, 2010. What happens is, is that when you work with many organizations and you begin to show up, um, organizations like Direct Relief International will contact me as soon as um, a, a disaster happens to see how we can take care of the mothers who are pregnant and the babies that are arriving and the children. Uh, we were at the earthquake in, in Dating, Nepal in 2015, uh, in Lete in the Philippines, the big superstar 2000. 13, Lombok, Indonesia, 2018, and the same year in Sulawesi, we had a terrible, terrible destruction from earthquakes and liquefaction. And then of course, our own eruption um, here in Indonesia and, and unfolding from that has been our response to the, to the uh, global pandemic. Okay, so let's go on to the next. I feel like when we reached the shoreline in Aceh, when we, we finally got from, from where, we, where we gathered in Maidan and then got into Aceh, um, the hardest thing for me at first was, um, was to see thousands of children's slippers scattered. They were there, but there were no, ch the children were not there. They lost their shoes. Um, trying to get away from the tsunami waters. Um, and I love Pema Chondron. And she talked about um, only to the extent that we expose ourselves over and over to annihilation can that which is indestructibly, indestructible be found within us. And uh, it was her books and her writing that um, we read to each other and we translated into Indonesian language uh, when we were having our hardest days and nights in Aceh. Okay, next. Next slide. Hello. 
Can you hear me? Oh, there you go. So one of the things that we do do with children um, and adults, of course, is that we, we bring art supplies. We bring paper. When we run out of paper, we use the back, the back of cardboard vitamin boxes or whatever um, the food comes packed in. We save everything and we use it. And um, Kenneth Patchen, who was a poet who suffered much in his lifetime, many of you may, might be familiar with his work, um, he said, have you wondered why all the windows in heaven were broken? Have you seen the homeless in the open grave of God's hand? And this is a, a child who lost his entire family and he made this drawing of what he saw when the tsunami hit after the 9.3 earthquake in Aceh. Okay, next slide. These are traditional midwives working with uh, what, what, what are licensed midwives with a more modern education. So you see the younger midwives in the picture um, got, got to go to school. The elder women uh, never went to school, but they were taught by their grandmothers who were taught by their grandmothers. And um, these women in Aceh um, were incredible, not only survivors, but they were trailblazers in how to, how to heal communities when something completely devastating happens. Um, when we got to the Molobu area, uh, which was the epicenter of that earthquake and, and then subsequent tsunami that destroyed you know, the, the, the Northern half of Sumatra Island, uh, we found that there were 156 midwives and traditional birth attendants before the earthquake and tsunami and afterwards only 32 survived. All of them lost family, all of them homeless and all of them ready to work to take care of their communities and to get back on their feet and be healers in whatever capacity they could possibly be. So um, some of these women are no longer um, with us. They've joined the ancestors and uh, some of them have grown older, much older even the young ones, and uh, we're all still working together in Aceh. Okay, next. Ibu Eli had four children before the tsunami struck. Uh, two of her daughters, uh, a toddler and a baby in arms, um, were lost in the violence of the waters. Uh, she, a lot, her, she and her husband survived with two of the children, and together with, there, there were four families total. They were able to go from living in completely out in the open to then getting a tarp. And then later they were able to dig out the remains of a house. Uh, the markings on the wall behind me would represent the mud that um, the house was, I would say probably six or more feet up the wall. You could see that it was totally um, covered in mud and it was full of mud. And then above that, you could see the water line. Ibu Eli uh, found herself pregnant and 11 months after the tsunami, uh, she safely birthed these twin girls. Uh, I knew that that she was probably expecting twins. We had no ultrasound, we had no electricity. We had no way to confirm that except for laying my hands on her. And then actually it was on my birthday on the 24th of November. Uh, we had this amazing event. There was no way that Ibu Eli could have made her way to our makeshift clinic, but um, I had a dream that she needed me. so. I got up from the dream and asked someone to drive me into to where she was living with these other families. And uh, she was for sure enough in labor. And we had two little baby girls. That's Mawar and Bunga, Rose and Flower. And it was such an incredible celebration for the entire community of survivors for this mother to have two babies like that after losing two children in the tsunami waters. Okay, next. Okay, in the Philippines, when the typhoon struck, this is what we found upon arriving. Um, this is the kind of devastation that was everywhere. We found nine islands uh, with totally homeless people. 
It was one of the most difficult things to to come upon when we arrived there on site. It was really, um, it was upsetting. I feel like for the people I work with, for our Bumi Sehat teams, for uh, all of us, the thing that helped us to carry on and to do our work was to really fall in love with the people, work with the people, get those midwives on the ground and nurses and doctors back to work, serving their communities. Um, being part of the solution really does help to heal the trauma of going into a completely devastated community. Okay, next, next photo. So we have to ask that question when there are millions of people, um, homeless, hungry, thirsty, and without shelter, uh, what, what is it that, um, how can we begin to rebuild a community? And uh, I feel like what we, what we learned was we learned to go in baby steps and to be excited about those baby steps. You know, sometimes it's just moving some piles of wood and making it orderly, helping a family do that. Um, and then in these communities, it's very difficult because entire families were wiped out. And unless someone reported the dead, the dead were never counted. So it was one of those kinds of situations where we knew that um, the numbers of, of reported lost souls were much, much more than ever could be recorded. Okay, next. Lorena. Lorena is a Filipino midwife. She has six children. She would show up uh, to, her, to her time of work, her shifts, looking like a supermodel. And we would say, Lorena, how is it that, you know, she lived in a house that was partially destroyed. Uh, she was so blessed because all six of her children survived, not, not so well for her neighbors, who most of them lost children. Um, and she, she would wear, wear lipstick every day. And we'd say to her, how is it that you show up to receive babies into the world in a tent, in a disaster zone. How is it that you show up so beautiful? And she would say, this face, this, this smiling face with lipstick, this is how I say I love you to all the women I'm looking after. All those women, my smile is a Valentine for each of them. And it's my way so that the moment they look at me, they see love. And I just love her philosophy. She's an incredible practicing Filipino midwife. So in the first uh, 13 months after the, in the aftermath of the typhoon Haiyan, the, the largest typhoon to make landfall in a populated area in recorded history, we did 777 births. Uh, we, we received 777 babies. Some of them uh, were two at a time because we had twins. And, uh, you know, some of them by the side of the road, some of them, we receive one baby into the world in a Coca-Cola truck. And we, we prove that, that the outcomes for childbirth could actually be in a little tent in a, with a conglomeration of midwives working together on the ground there, even in a, a devastating disaster, our outcomes could be better than the national average. And it's because we got down to our roots, to our indigenous knowledge of what mommies and babies really need. Right here, Lorena is just holding that baby and waiting for this mother to reach for her own baby and bring her own baby to her heart. What an empowering moment. Instead of just throwing that baby up on top of the mother, uh, we want to initiate skin to skin contact, but we want to give that mother a little pregnant pause. She's gone from being very pregnant um, to having a baby. And uh, we just want to give her a moment so she can take her own baby to her own heart. And we feel like that first embrace, protecting the first embrace of life in the Philippines, we call it Unang Yakap. And by protecting the first embrace of life, every single baby can have a much more gentle landing and a, and a, a less traumatic birth. Okay, next. Okay, so when a, when a mother who's pregnant doesn't have sufficient food, she doesn't have potable water, 
All of our mothers in the Philippines during this disaster had no shelter at all. They're, the risk of having premature and stillborn babies, of course, increases. This is uh, midwife Jacqueline Aurora, who's actually uh, Native American from, the, um, from Alaska, from the United States in the Alaskan area. Um, she became our all-night preemie angel. Um, she would help mothers whose babies were tiny, tiny, and who couldn't even suck um, to go skin to skin. She's holding this baby. The baby's little shirt is open and this baby is skin to skin with her while um, someone takes that mother to the bathroom so that she can uh, empty her bladder in the middle of the night. So we taught mothers how to pump milk without breast pumps, how to manually express. We, we had so many ways without incubators, without electricity to help our preemies survive. And they did so well based on what we know. I mean, the evidence is there, the research is there to support what we did with in the, I would say the disasters are the highest risk, lowest resource places that you could possibly have a baby on earth. Okay, next. Mm -hmm. So the other thing is, is when the whole world tumbles upside down, you end up with a lot of breech babies. And those of you that are birth keepers out there, you know that you, um, most of the policies in most countries now are to uh, get a breech mother to go straight into a, a belly birth or a cesarean birth. And, um, you know, there's all kinds of evidence that breech babies do have um, lower APGAR scores, things like that. In uh, the first two months that we were in the Philippines, in just that two month period, we received 14 breech babies in a tent, um, no hospital to transport to. Um, during uh, Bali's volcanic eruption, there were seven breech, there, there were 14 breech babies in seven weeks. Uh, seven were born without complications because in Bali, we still had hospitals and still had regulations. Seven were transported to hospital for assisted birth. Um, Okay, over and that should be very short umbilical cords. Very short umbilical cords will happen in times of strife. So one of the things that we like to do in times of difficulty is to encourage the mothers to eat as well as they can and provide them with nutrients and vitamins and plenty of drinking water so they can grow longer cords. So this is a babe, breech baby that was born beautifully safely. And if you ever find yourself receiving a breech baby into the world, get that mom hands and knees and this is the safest position you can receive a breech baby into the world. Okay, next slide. Okay, so here's a mother who hemorrhaged quite badly. This is a non-nomadic um, anti-shock um, garment. It's, um, it requires no electricity. There's no special pumps. Uh, it's very easy to put on. It has to be put on correctly and taken off correctly. Um, and it will make it so that a mother who's had an extreme postpartum hemorrhage will be able to, um, to push that, that blood in, that is left in her body to her organs, her brain, her heart, to keep her not only alive, but to give her body time. Um, sometimes with, with the help of this um, anti-shock garment, you can get an IV in. Uh, this mother stayed with her baby. Uh, there was no place where we could get her blood transfusions. So we used uh, IV fluids and we slowly helped her recuperate. And um, she did very, very, very well. So, um, you know, you, for example, this um, anti-shock garment makes it so that for if you have to evacuate um, any kind of maybe bits of placenta or something causing her to hemorrhage from the vagina, there is access there. Um, and again, the, there's still access for the mother to uh, breastfeed her baby. So it's, it's a brilliant, brilliant, um, beautiful tool that we use. It, it also can be washed and used many times. And um, we didn't have um, washing machines. So everything was washed by hand by our midwives. Okay, next. Next slide. Solar lights. Um, the solar suitcases from We Care Solar were brilliant and uh, water filters. Um, these are Sawyer's water filters. 
There's a beautiful uh, nonprofit organization called Wine to Water. So those are two organizations that do a lot of help, life-saving help in the um, in the climate crisis areas. Um, we Care Solar and then wa um, Wine to Water. Wine to Water started when a bartender would tell people that they didn't need another drink. What they needed was to give him money to make sure that communities in crisis could get water filters and so they could have safe drinking water. This midwife, uh, we were able to help her restore her practice. We got the roof put back on her, her little um, birthing center. We got her a solar suitcase and water filters. The solar suitcase made it possible for her to work all night, which midwives have to work all night. Um, we found birth centers in the Philippines, for example, we found one that burned to the ground, even after the birth center was still partially standing after the giant typhoon. And um, that community also experienced three weeks before that um, a terrible earthquake. And yet it burned to the ground when a candle lit it, lit a curtain on fire while a birth was happening. So light is essential. And even more than that, um, safe drinking water, very important. Okay, next slide. This is a mass grave in Palo. Um, terrible, terrible situation, but um, we, we tried when, um, when finding bodies to put them in a place where people could find their, their dead and make, um, make a connection and have some closure. Okay, next. That's um, Isabella community uh, in the Philippines, in the Visayas, and um, bringing food relief. Each of those bags um, was full of sweet potatoes, rice, um, water filters, everything we could think of, tarps, just really nice, blue gigantic plastic tarps as big as you could get them um, string to tie them up with um, a machete a, we call it a bolo knife in the philippines a machete is an incredible tool because it can be used to hammer nails it can be used to cut bamboo it can be used to clean up uh, it was what the people asked for you know the people in isabel that was one of the only houses standing in the entire area and when we, we made contact with the people of Isabel, we sent people in and um, we said, what do you need? 100% homeless people. And they didn't say, give us a house. They said, do you think you could give us a machete? If we had a machete, we could do better. So these are the kind of things that makes, make total sense. Uh, when thinking about disasters, think about what is culturally appropriate and what the people really need because you can't possibly give everyone a home when they need it, but you can give every family a machete. Okay, next. Next slide. Um, so we serve as a liaison between surviving communities because we're from those communities. You know, we immediately find people who have survived. Um, sometimes, for example, some of the communities in the Philippines, we found our heroes from those areas who were in school in Manila. And we pulled them out because, of course, school closed after that. And we brought them in. There was a German uh, organization called Navis, and they brought in incredible water filters and medical supplies. And, and they had all kinds of help to give, but they didn't know where to start. And so for their first couple of weeks on the ground, they set all this stuff up and nobody came because they didn't know where the people were, but we helped to liaison them um, and, and to find the people and get the people what they needed, which is in this case was potable, safe drinking water. Okay, next. Hmm. This is Dewey, she's 16 years old. And an ambulance arrived, uh, in the middle of the day and in Nepal, we were in Dadiing. Uh, we were, uh, the health center had been destroyed. There was one building standing, but it was leaning over. So all we could do was run inside, quickly grab beds out, things like that, and move them into our tents. We made the tent a safe area where women could give birth unobserved. 
uh, where um, people people felt like they had a place where they could come and women would help women. And uh, day we arrived in an ambulance where uh, we ran to greet the ambulance. And when we opened it, it was full of hay and animal droppings. And out comes a hugely pregnant teenager. And um, Shanti, who was a Nepalese midwife that I was working with there, and I looked at each other and right away we said, twins. And um, it's a really good thing that they didn't try on. They had, they had already driven for three hours plus. And if they would have pushed on another two and a half hours into Kathmandu, uh, Davy wouldn't have made it because she would have hemorrhaged. The first twin would have been fine, but the second twin would not have made it. We needed to resuscitate her. So it was a really happy thing. Um, Davy's holding, besides her baby, she's holding a, um, a solar light that she's been given, a solar lantern. She's also given water filters. And... She, she didn't smile the entire time she was with us. But every time one of the midwives sat down with her or one of the nurses or the paramedics, she put her feet on our feet. And I felt like that was, a, that was somehow a symbol that she felt heard, she felt, she felt safe. Uh, the Nepalese government also gives those little baby clothes and gives mothers, it, it gets pretty cold up there gives mothers warm clothes that uh, she can wear while breastfeeding. Um, this was not uh, Dewi's first birth. She had had a, a baby when she was 14 who died of pneumonia. So this is her second birth. And what she said to us over and over again, and uh, my interpreter was amazing. She said, my babies were born homeless. My babies were born homeless because the home had fallen down during the earthquake. Um, it's we were able to also send her home with a tarp so that her young husband could put up some kind of a shelter from the rain and uh, and the weather. And we're hoping that she did well. We really are. Uh, my interpreter was also a paramedic and her dream was to become a midwife. And so um, women that I knew all over the world, I asked them through my um, Facebook to contribute money for her for for Sabita to go back to school. Uh, so that she could become a midwife. Currently, Sabita's uh, receiving about 25 babies a month into the world. She's finished her, her school and done very, very well for her people. So, okay, next. Next slide, okay. All of these photos were shared by the mothers with permission. This is Sapana, uh, her, her name means dream. And when she arrived at our birthing tent, she told us that she could not love her baby, that she didn't have any love left inside of her. The home that she was living in fell and took away. Her two-year-old son died. Her husband's mother and father and her mother and father all died under the same fallen home. And here she was about to have a baby. And she just kept saying, I don't have any love left in me. And when she got inside the tent and she saw that there was a curtain so that when people entered, they didn't see her. There was, there was privacy, there was love, there was food for her, there was drinking water, uh, there, was, there were, was clothing and blankets for her baby because she showed up, of course, with nothing but the clothes that she was wearing. And she said, oh, this is very nice. And then she proceeded to pretty quickly have her baby. This baby's halfway born and she reaches for him. And what she said was so beautiful. She said, are you mine? Are you mine? Now, Sapna's husband was working on a cruise ship and he was not given leave to come home. And I found this consistently in the Philippines also. Men working on cruise ships when a disaster strikes are not given leave to come home and take care of their families. Um, that was a pretty terrible pretty terrible fact. But we were able later, literally late just after the baby was born to contact him by our little hand phones. And uh, the hand phone signal um, was, was restored very quickly in Nepal by the communications companies. But we were able to contact Sap and his husband so he could <coughs> sing to and meet his baby. Okay, next. Next slide. <coughs> this is Lombok in 2018. 
And this is uh, wearing the little hat is midwife Booty. She's accompanied me on many, many disasters. This was her own, her own home island. And I was actually with her <coughs> when we um, were able to find the remains of her village after this big earthquake. We were also together for subsequent earthquakes, big earthquakes in the area. And with the help of Direct Relief International, we were able to eventually build a beautiful clinic in Lombok for the people there in Gunung Sari. Okay, next slide. Next slide. Can you advance the slide? This is Lombok again. You can see it was a pretty bleak situation. Um, very bleak. Um, but the mothers were so hopeful and, and the midwives in that area so happy to get back to work as quickly as possible to help their communities heal. Okay, next slide. Sulawesi, Indonesia. This was a four-story building before the 2018 earthquake. Okay, next slide. And by the way, that building you just saw, there was a wedding going on when the earthquake happened. It was full of people. This is the iconic Palu Bridge. Um, after the earthquake, this is what we found. It was supposed to be invincible. It, it was um, a bridge to, to connect to, uh, the peninsula to the mainland. Okay, next slide. Liquefaction in Palu. This is something I'd never seen before having, it wasn't our first rodeo. We'd been to many, many, many disasters already. But when the ground for entire areas of a city turns to quicksand and it happens very quickly, it's, uh, it's something you, can, you cannot even describe. Even walking there weeks and weeks later, um, still looking for any signs of life in buildings. We were able to find a mother who was breastfeeding her baby, and we heard the cries of the baby. Um, there was a little space underneath her tin roof where she and the baby had survived. Um, so go ahead to the next slide. But the ground is still spongy after liquefaction. This is a... a a shopping center, this is just what we found in Palu. That shopping center was, um, it was in the, in the uh, early evening, about 5.30 in the afternoon. And the shopping centers in Indonesia fill up with teenagers. That's where they go in the cities. So that was a terrible place to be. Okay, next slide. Also Palu. These were buildings that were two, three stories high before the, what happened in Palu was giant earthquake and then a tsunami and um, then liquefaction and then all kinds of flooding and, and terrible um, events in the aftermath. Okay, next slide. That was where the tsunami hit in Palu on the shore. Okay, next slide. This is inland in the communities that were cut off. Um, and I just, this is uh, passing food and medical supplies out of helicopter and the children, they just couldn't wait to get in the picture. Um, everywhere we went, the children who survived un, un, unimaginable trauma um, were, were really, they were just amazing to me. In the Philippines, uh, the children would stand on the shoreline when the sun was setting and they were 100% homeless children and they would sing the Let It Go song at sunset every day together. They would hold hands and sing Let It Go, children that had nothing, children that at 4.30 in the morning would shake my little tent and ask me, say Lola, which means grandmother, Lola Robin, do you have any cliff bars? God bless cliff bars because they shipped a lot of food in. And when you see entire families sharing one cliff bar for their food for an entire day, um, you can really understand how the, what gratitude really means. Okay, next slide. 
So for this one, can you press the button there so that you can see what happens with liquefaction? Can you do that for me? Uh, I don't think that's possible for some reason. It's not playing. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, it plays on my computer when I, but I don't know. Anyway, this entire area just becomes a blur where all of the buildings are completely wiped out. Um, yeah, I wish that could play, but that was where the liquefaction happened in Sulawesi. So there were four very big areas that became like quicksand, but they had modern homes on them. So it was pretty terrible. Okay, next slide. Of course, many of you are there in California and you're experiencing the climate crisis fires. Um, when my daughter had her, one of my daughters had her first baby there in Santa Rosa, California, um, just uh, almost exactly nine months after the really big devastating fire in Santa Rosa. And the groundwater was so polluted with the microplastics that had seeped down that many, many people uh, were having, many pregnant women were having the experience of their placentas abrupting or coming loose during the labor process, including my daughter. So she went from having a very nice, gentle, natural childbirth to an emergency belly birth or cesarean. Her next baby was born completely naturally at home. But when I talked to the maternity nurses um, at the hospitals and the midwives in the area, they told me that they were seeing an epidemic of abrupting placentas and they felt like something was wrong because of the fires, the placentas were not able to hold on um, through the labor process. And so a lot of stillborn babies. Fortunately, my grandson Bear was safely born by a life-saving life belly birth. Remember, belly births are a miracle too. Okay, next. Uh, this is our birth team in Jacmel, Haiti in 2010. Um, in that little tent, we received dozens of babies every day and night. It was incredible. Um, really, a lot of these, um, these um, people, well, I would say that all of the medical workers at the remains of the hospital where we worked um, were homeless. Um, we found doctors and families of five living in their car. Um, it was through the Rotary uh, Clubs International, I was able to get tents for the, the healthcare providers. Um, because one, one day I couldn't understand why a doctor was being very, very not, not compassionate at all. And I, I felt like that wasn't who he really was. And he, he broke down. He said, do you think I have a home? Do you think that my family has drinking water? And in order to get a tent, if they distributed 150 tents, 2,000 people would be standing in line. And the, and the people working in hospitals providing health care, they couldn't stand in line, you know. And then when you go and see that the car that the family's living in is smashed, it's not even a whole car. Um, anyway, we were able to give them beautiful shelter boxes with incredible tents and supplies that you need to survive a cook stove a little cook stove and pots and pans and even some toys for children and art supplies, things like that, all included in the shelter boxes. They're a wonderful project. Okay, next. So one of the things that we had to come up with was when there's no such thing as a way to sterilize uh, instruments to safely clamp and cut babies umbilical cords. I personally don't like to clamp and cut babies umbilical cords. I don't do it. Um, the, the younger midwives do it here, but we do it after three hours because it's a human right to get all of your blood supply uh, when you're born. Um, there's, there's a tremendous amount of blood, about 150 milliliters um, of the baby's blood is still in the placenta at the time of birth and you have to wait. And so we would we'll, we wait generally for three hours when we say hot because the baby goes skin to skin, breastfeeding. You don't want to interrupt the first golden hours of life for bonding. But what we found was is after a few hours when we want to sever the cord, when you're in a disaster zone, you need uh, to come up with a way to, to cauterize the cord without any chance of there being a tetanus infection. And 
Uh, we first taught the traditional midwives. These are young uh, village midwives that were educated in college, and they're being instructed by myself and two traditional midwives uh, in how to safely um, burn the cord so that the baby would not be burned, but the baby could be separated from the placenta after a few hours. It was a really, really incredible way to first teach the elder women um, that are honored in their communities, the survivors of the tsunami, and then they teach the younger midwives and medical professionals. Okay, next. You can see this umbilical cord is still full of life, full of blood. Uh, if this baby had been born in a hospital, that would have been immediately severed, uh, clamped and cut. Um, I know that World Health Organization, of course, for a many, well, more than a decade, I would say at least 15 or more years, has been saying that the immediate clamping and cutting of a baby's umbilical cord is a, is a protocol that must be questioned. Um, but people still habitually do it, people in childbirth. Um, imagine if this baby didn't get his full blood supply. I mean, it's just so beautiful to watch that blood move from the placenta with, with, you know, the help of the umbilical cord is still alive. It's still working and pushing that blood into the baby. Um, yeah, it's really, it's culturally inappropriate, for example, in Indonesia to immediately clamp and cut the cord because it's against their, what the, their beliefs here. Um, so it was easier to implement, although I will say that um, some modern protocols, including immediate, immediately clapping and cutting of the umbilical cord, uh, were, have been spread all over the world. And it, it, it really is causing um, a profound newborn anemia. And when you cause that to happen, you also sabotage breastfeeding because it's more difficult for the baby to latch on when they are profoundly anemic. Uh, 150 milliliters from immediate cord clamping and cutting up to some research shows up to 210 milliliters of blood is a third of the baby's blood supply or more. So we have to really, really just wait. There's no hurry. Being born is an, an operation to rescue the baby from the, from the inside of a mother. The inside of a mother is not a dangerous place. You know, it, everything needs to slow down and take some heartbeats and let the physiological miracle of childbirth um, unfold as it was meant to do, as it was meant to be. No other mammal interferes with that process the way humans do. Okay, next. And this is uh, in the Philippines. So I've, I've taken you all over the world. I've taken you to Aceh, Indonesia, to the Philippines, uh, to Haiti. Uh, back and forth, we've bounced around the world now. I love what this mother was doing. She was smiling. She was on the street in Tacloban. Um, what you don't see in the picture is one story high piles of the remains of modern life, uh, piled up telephone wire and broken plastic chairs and parts of houses and sheet glass and twisted metal all piled up. And there she is breastfeeding her baby and smiling. And I asked her if I could take her picture. And she was so happy about that um, and her little boy. And you can see that the baby who, when the new baby was born, the little boy who was weaned, you can see he's really suffering from some malnutrition, um, just the, the texture of his hair. Um, he, was, he was definitely having been abruptly weaned when the new baby was born. Um, we gave this mother a box of food after we took her picture. And she said, you didn't have to pay me for my picture. And we said, well, do you need food? She says, yes, I really need that food, but you didn't have to pay me. But that's how beautiful uh, her heart was and how, I mean, I was just so inspired by this little family. They don't have a father. They lost their father in the, uh, in the typhoon. Okay, next. This is our teams getting ready to go out um, on disaster relief. Dr. Adi uh, in blue is Nurse Liman, who's been to numerous disasters. He's living and working in his native island of Lombok. Uh, he was in Aceh for many years uh, and he, um, he really is a leader in the community. Ibu Budi in the white hat, a leader in her community. She's head of medicine in Lombok and all of the team in Bali getting ready with donated tents, 
water filters again, solar lights, everything that we need to be able to go in and, and start work. Food and water, very important. Water, number one. So bringing water filters was our number one priority. Okay, next. This is Ibu Budi Astuti from the village of uh, Gunung Sari. Her family's entire village was destroyed. Uh, and this was a pregnant mother that we found um, just squatting by the remains of her house. And she couldn't even cry. She couldn't even cry. And then the smile on her face when she's brought into a tent and given a prenatal exam and a bag of groceries is what she really needed and a water filter. Okay, next. So we really, as birth keepers, um, as people who are helping after disasters, we need to be able to go wherever we're needed. This is a, a mother who um, is having her third baby. That was her home. She, we were called there uh, in the middle of the night um, because so one of the things we do is we would give little tiny inexpensive hand phones to families that would have no way to contact us otherwise, especially when they didn't have transportation to come in. So the midwives could jump in to whatever vehicle we had available and go and respond to the mother's call. She gave birth very quickly. That's her home. She had a beautiful home that she and her husband um, and her husband's family had built over two generations that was completely destroyed in the earthquake but they were able to cobble together this little home. And so um, our midwives were able to help her. Again, we need to be able to go where we're needed. Okay, next. These are the Rohingya women um, living at the Hope Hospital in Bangladesh. Each of them has a terrible heartbreaking story and we don't have time to repeat them here but all of them have survived the unthinkable, really walking barefoot from Myanmar, from their country to Bangladesh. Um, uh, terrible, terrible stories. And one of the things that they really needed was for the midwives and the nurses to just listen to them sometimes. They just wanted you to sit. You could help them breastfeed. You could help them um, get the help that they needed, help them give birth. But they then wanted to tell you their story. Okay, next slide. This is in Okinawa. I like to call it the golden chain of support that sometimes the poorest women in the poorest places, I mean, I saw it in Bangladesh, um, have a tiny little gold chain on. And what's in the middle of that chain? The woman. And that every single person in her life represents a link in that chain. And if you can be a strong link in that chain, of that golden chain of support for a mother who's going to give birth. Um, you know, miracles happen. This was a mother who was 41 when she had her baby and she was very afraid. She had miscarriages. She had a very hard time uh, achieving pregnancy. And now she's about to have her baby at a little birth center in Okinawa. And so we did a little blessing way for her. Okay, next slide. Next slide. This is the Angel Hiromi Bumi Sehat with Earth Company. We built this beautiful birth center in Papua. Um, it's an incredible birth center. The Papuan people were hit really hard by the pandemic. This is pre-pandemic when we were opening the birth center. And um, it was such a blessing. The people of this community gave us the land because they wanted a birth center so badly. And then a man who was widowed, his wife's dying wish was uh, to take care of mothers and babies. She never could have children herself. And her way of fulfilling her dream to be a mother was uh, for the money that she left when she died to be used to build this clinic. And uh, yeah, Maru Yamasan, her husband, fulfilled her dream. He's also helped to contribute money to our birth center in the Philippines. In the Philippines, the indigenous mothers gave us two hectares of land because they wanted our Bumi Sehat presence there. Uh, where we are in, in um, the Philippines in Palawan, uh, it's the highest teen pregnancy rate on earth. Okay, next slide. 
This is Ibu Dewa. She's no longer with us. She's with the ancestors. And I just wanted to share her with you this moment of how uh, she connected with mothers so full of love. She was the brightest light and still is a bright light in our lives, even though she's no longer in the body. Okay, next slide. Uh, I, I know many of you are familiar with what a doula is. If you're not, um, doulas are someone who mothers the mother. They are with women in pregnancy, pregnancy, childbirth, and postpartum, but they don't have a medical role. They have a supportive role. And this is Toba Pearl, who was, um, she's doula with us uh, in the Philippines and in Indonesia during the disasters. Uh, I remember one night we had, received in our tent 11 babies in 12 hours we were exhausted and we left two midwives with the postpartum moms and the rest of the midwives went to bed and then uh, it felt like about a minute later uh, i had fallen asleep and someone was shaking my tent and yelling lola lola grandmother grandmother uh, there's a mother who's convulsing and that was a a, a First time mom was brought to us in a full eclamptic uh, fit, which is usually life threatening. And um, I jumped out of the tent, ran. We were putting IVs in her actually to stabilize her. I had to lay down on top of her body and hold her steady so we could get IVs in her and some magnesium so that we could uh, stop the convulsing. And her baby was quickly born. And while that was going on, one of the Filipino midwives yelled, Somebody wake up our doula because the doula was so important. The role she could play, sometimes it was just making a cup of hot chocolate, you know, instant hot chocolate mix. That's what every mother wanted after her birth. And that's one of the things that Toba provided for us. Um, documenting the details of what happened in the birth. When you have an emergency birth and all hands are on deck, keeping the mother and baby alive, Nobody's writing anything down, but the doula would write it down. So we had really good records. Okay, next. This is right after we had a pretty good size earthquake here in Bali during our eruption phase. And um, together with my midwives in Bali and a beautiful Japanese artist that lives in Hawaii, who's a friend, we were able to um, make coloring books. Uh, for inspiration. And so I was at home, which is very close to the, the childbirth center and community health clinic. And as soon as everything, everyone at home, my grandchildren were safe, I ran as fast as I could to the clinic and found that all the mothers and babies were safe and breastfeeding well. And our midwives, um, as a stress buster, were all coloring and each of them have their own coloring book. We're all coloring. And I thought that was so wonderful that the tools for coping that they had. These are very young midwives. Most of them we put through school. If a young girl in, that we are in contact with or whose family contacts us has a dream to become a midwife or a nurse, uh, we find a way to find a sponsor, someone who will pay for her education. And we, we step-by-step help her get through that experience so that she can serve her community. Okay, next slide. Four fathers of four faiths from four islands that all had babies the same night. Um, a Muslim, a Hindu, a Christian, and a Buddhist father and from different islands. And they all became best friends. And they asked me to take their photo together. Okay, next slide. This is our team at Bumi Sehat. We try to be prepared. Um, those are our heroes. They're... they're the most amazing, fun people to work with in every way. Oh, and there beside me is my mother who's turning 90 um, in the middle of June. And she lives here with us. So I have four generations at home. Okay, next slide. So there is that circle of support, that golden chain. Perry, uh, her, mid her mother is a midwife. She had her doula. She had her husband with her. She had her best friends. And the baby, and this is the baby was born the night before. It was, um, wasn't an easy birth. We had to resuscitate this baby. And uh, you can see the little green bowl. The placenta is still attached. The mother hasn't uh, given us a, um, 
a signal or she hasn't told us yet that she wants the placenta detached from her baby. So she's still waiting. And placentas are really honored with beautiful burial here in this culture. Okay, next. So during the pandemic, this is how we dress at work. We're wearing these, these uh, you know, pandemic costumes, but the love shines through, even with PPE on. Those tender moments of touch. Sometimes when a mother looks distressed and it seems like everyone is wearing these costumes around her, in labor, we do not make the mothers wear masks. But the, when, the, when the mothers feel, look distressed, I'll hear the young midwives say, or the elder midwives say, if you can't tell whether I'm, I'm with you or not, look at my eyes. You can see my eyes. And I'm, I'm sending you love with my eyes. I know it's hard to have someone uh, approaching you in childbirth with all these costumes on. We try to make it nice colors too. Okay, next. And this is uh, our volcano erupting in a moment that was caught by this young couple's um, mother. And uh, just, I guess my message is that our babies are listening and that throughout these coming years and this time of, of climate crisis, we have to remember that the babies are listening. Okay, next. I think that's it. Thank you, Robin. You're welcome. I hope I didn't take too much time, Stephanie. That every moment was precious. Mm -hmm. I want to, I am deeply moved by every moment. Uh, I am building a cultural library of regenerative health resources. It's part of the vision of regenerative health for a climate changing world. Everything you do belongs in that library. The vision is that it can be downloaded instantaneously with or without an internet connection to provide the incredible grounded wisdom that you live. I want to invite everyone to donate to Bumi Sehat. I want to invite everyone listening and to tell their friends to support Ibu Robin Lim and her work. If you are moved to join her, perhaps you're moved to become a doula or a midwife. If you are moved to be engaged in this incredible service to the future of humanity, please support Bumi Sehat and Ibu Robin Lim. If you want to put a link in the Chat, of course, you're welcome to do that, Robin, but I don't think you're difficult to find. Uh, she also has a Facebook page uh, where she frequently mentions the doulas uh, in training that you could support individually. This is, if you can support anything, I'm gonna ask you to support my work, but if you have a choice between supporting Robin or supporting my work, please support Bumi Sehat. Please. Terima kasih. We thought that when the pandemic began, because we faced 80% unemployment here, and about 200 families a week are getting basic groceries from us. Tourism has just begun to, to begin again here. Uh, but when you lose tourism on an island like this, it was over 80% unemployment. The farmers didn't have um, anywhere they could sell their vegetables or their fruits. And uh, we did do all kinds of feeding programs. But for example, for the elderly, we found the elderly in the villages were not eating. So the restaurants that closed, some of them uh, worked with us to feed the elderly so that they wouldn't die you know, so they wouldn't be hungry. Uh, the numbers of mothers who died in the pandemic here, uh, just from a high maternal mortality rate from mostly hemorrhage after childbirth on this island, and the medical care has gotten so much improved in the last 30 years since I've been here. But um, it used to be four to nine mothers a year died. In 2021, in the first seven months, we lost 89 mothers 
who died in labor with COVID. So um, it was really bad. It was really bad here. It's improved very much. But one of the things we've been able to do was not only keep all six of our community health and childbirth centers, our clinics and childbirth centers open, we were able to feed families, 200 families a week, getting groceries, getting two weeks worth of groceries was an unbelievable way to support communities in need. We also had a big earthquake here uh, last last um, October, and 1,117 families were left homeless um, up on the mountain. And, uh, and because of our generous donors and supporters and contributors, we were able um, to really help those communities bring medical relief and food right away. And, and um, there are programs to try to rebuild um, more traditional houses because the cement block houses fall down. They don't do well in storms or earthquakes. So, This is uh, regenerative health for a climate changing world. This is the nitty gritty of it. And Ibu Robin Lim is meeting indomitably every one of these catastrophes. And you can hear it in your voice, Robin the grounded, steady, persevering commitment to life. Mm. Thank you. I don't do it alone. We have a, we have a big team. Uh, each, of, each of our centers has a big and devoted team. And they're fun. You know, at three in the morning when I get a call that I need to get down to the clinic because someone has shown up with a little foot foot sticking out and uh, they, the, the midwives want some extra support from a grandmother midwife. Uh, when, when I'm running to be with them, I'm happy. It doesn't matter if you get woken mm -hmm. up in the morning, if you're with people that you absolutely adore working with. Um, we had, um, we have so much support, such love here. And that's what we really believe is that love is our secret. Mm -hmm. So much of regenerative health is in every word you're saying. And the message that being active, doing what you are called to do is resilience, does provide that vibrancy. Now here it is in the middle of the night where Ibu Robin has chosen, elected to join me in this summit because she's so at one with the flame that lives within her. Mm. We're deeply grateful to have traveled, to walk in your shoes and to see how you are investing in the children of the future. They are our future and that's what this day of the summit is about Thank what you. is our responsibility to the children of the future. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to turn now to Dr. Allison Davis. And it's a nice, really nice transition because Allison is a a counselor, a therapist, an ecofeminist, but what she's doing is really illuminating the way for mothers, either women who are preparing to be mothers, are new mothers, or are pregnant, to help them embrace the magnitude of threat that's in the world their children will inhabit. This is very linked to everything that I'm doing. How do we honestly, authentically prepare, not hide the truth, not pretend that everything's going to be okay? Because we don't know that it will be, likely will not be. How do we bear our children? How do we help them have the sensory, this is what I will speak to, the sensory capacity 
to inhabit and thrive and contribute to the world we have left them. Allison. Thank you um, for, for laying that out there. And then Ibu Robin, thank you for, for sharing your work. Um, I'm two months postpartum, so again, um, so that the, the children are listening really resonates. And I think that that's something that I'll be taking forward, um, you know, just as foundational wisdom. Um, I am a counselor, a researcher, um, and an educator. So I, I teach future counselors, and I also research um, within Teachers College in what is known as the Maternal Psych Lab. And um, so what I bring um, to talk about today is really what we're talking about as maternal eco-psychology and uh, applied to maternal eco-distress, which we're seeing more and more around climate and environmental related um, concerns. So I have a private practice um, on the unceded land of the Tehuantanos people where I hold space for climate concerns for mothers and monthly groups. So free groups, if you're a mom, definitely um, join us. And um, so I've seen this over the last five, six years as a growing concern. I had been working with adolescents and really working in dietic therapy to bring um, moms back together with their uh, daughters. Right, because in our culture we have um, a huge split in kind of Western psychology. Where, uh, what did your mom do <laughs> to to end you up in this in this space with me in therapy? And um, kind of pop psych calls that the mother wound. And um, I saw the ways that this relational um, space um, is infected by that that focus, that very human centered um, mother child understanding of attachment and connection and in you know ways to repair that would rebuild daughter's resilience and um, so the work that I do now focuses a lot on um, mothers uh, coming into their birthing times or um, even adopting children and coming into these concerns around climate change and the one way I just wanted to talk about the clinical assessment that we see in research, but it's um, a very simple one to do through expressive arts, which is what I do, um, because it's an experiential, effective, and embodied way to reconnect with our natures and um, you know the nature all around us that can be a healthy form of secure attachment. Um, and that's to think of yourself and think of nature as two circles and how those circles interrelate, um, overlap, or don't. And in doing that assessment of the last, um, you know, half a decade or something, I started to see very obviously um, that there is a shift in consciousness of um, uh, an a understanding of one's own place and place as including geographic, uh, social, and uh, soul-centric kind of understanding of place. Um, and that was causing the distress. So really from a developmental model, something innate that's happening in the process of becoming a mother. We, you know, thinking of rites of passage that um, our dominating culture has lost or uh, suppressed, coming up, arising through these experiences, through this um, relationship with child um, and self and causing the distress. So causing the, what our culture is often looking at as psychopathology. Um, but through a holistic model, holding model, realizing that it's a response to an absence. And what is that absence? And with a rite of passage lens, what is coming um, into play? And um, the kind of essential factor, I think, that the way nature is receding itself through this matricence experience, which I should have introduced as the theory I work with, which is, uh, you know, repairing this understanding of mothering motherhood as a developmental model that it's a developmental practice on the mom just as much as it is um, the ecosystem and the people and um, more than human people that are there. So the severance in the rite of passage is a severance from our dominating cultures um, understanding of separation of identity of that kind of um, anthropocentric or human centered very limiting understanding of ourselves. And so you know mothers are trying to initiate themselves to this um, next like, kind of a evolution of their consciousness, but without um, elders, without 
um, anyone to understand what's going on. And um, it's really, really causing a lot of mental health um, problems. And um, so that's, this happened to me. I should really personalize this first um, with my first daughter and going through Western psychological kind of spaces, um, being pathologized, but also the understanding of nature as alive and animate. You know, um, we talked a lot about remembering, but remembering this truth um, was definitely the aspect of my experience that was pathologized. And um, so I was seeking new models that I could work within and also um, have, you know, we know for adolescents, um, they'll self-initiate, right? If we don't honor the growth in the space and the development that they're going through. Um, and, and that's kind of what we're building is um, this space within maternal psychology to um, doula. We like the term doula because Dana Raphael in the 80s was the one who um, brought this term to us of mattresses as a rite of passage for mothers um, to doula this consciousness um, through environmental education, peer-to-peer -peer support groups that will face what's coming up so that we don't get stuck or the growth doesn't get distorted. And the concern is just briefly, and um, you know, as a white settler, that we have this kind of theory of green motherhood, this idea you can buy in through consumption to responsibility. And that supports dominating cultures and this idea that mothers will clean up after um, the, the systems, the corporations, the governments that are failing us. Um, and so that supports the dominating culture in an intersectional way. So trying to find um, a way through that conundrum within our culture and within um, uh, a space that supports mental um, health or mothers um, really live psycho effective experience. And um, yeah, so if there's any takeaways today, right, just, um, and you know a mom who's experiencing um, what might be known as eco distress, but right within this perspective is just distress um, through the perinatal period. What we're seeing is higher, or this is a contributor to suicidality in mothers, which we also know has increased within the pandemic because of all the other complicating factors but through a growth strength framework, um, it's, I find it's deeply healing to mothers to understand that they are growing beyond the limitations of our dominating culture. And that, uh, what they would call orthogonal ethics is what is making us feel sick, right? And so we have ways um, going into our own lineage is widely defined um, to center nature, where nature is soul, nature psyche, as guide instead of having the therapist at the forefront, um, centering nature's wisdom and cyclical cycles to help us through that growth, but also knowing that there's a larger arc um, and listening through our effective experiences to what the earth is asking of us um, in its development, in their development, um, can be a, a way to find that resilience Stephanie's talking about, about our work. Um, in the way we can contribute to um, birthing our new earth experience. Thank you, Allison. And thank you to your daughter who <laughs> has remained asleep. Your three month old remained asleep, uh, soaking up the nourishing care that we're sending to mothers, to babies, to the children of the future. We are clearly going to be going over our time, but we have that flexibility. Jim, let me know if there's a problem with it. I know that uh, Peter Whitehouse and I will gladly shorten our comments. We are delighted to have given this space to really coming to grips with what women are dealing with in the world during a time when there is a war against women and how we are rising up and over and over and over again, we are hearing, as Ibu Robin said, the resilience of love, the resilience of, as Allison said, connection and looking without any denial 
at the threats before us. Dr. Peter Whitehouse speaks to both ends of the spectrum. He has important research about the aging brain. He's a neuroscientist. And he also serves young people and families. And I have to tell you a little bit of a secret. He looks like a man, but he's actually a tree. <laughs> Dr. Peter Whitehouse. Uh, Peter, I'm not hearing you. Uh, it looks like Peter. Peter Whitehouse, let me see if I can send him a message. You are muted. <laughs> Peter is miming. I, he's not seeing my message. He looks unmuted, but he is muted. Yeah, I, don't know. I, don't, I don't understand why, why his phone is not connecting his microphone. Yeah. He also doesn't seem to hear us because otherwise he would be realizing that we're speaking on top of him. Yeah. And there's no way we can get through. Love the picture. <laughs> so. I have put him on hold. Maybe that um, makes him understand what's going on. Uh, thank you, Georg. Thank you. So. The, we can get Peter been, back. Can you hear me? Can hear you now. Oh, okay, Peter. Now we can hear you. We haven't heard you up until this moment. Can you hear me now, Peter? Yes, I can. I'll take and now off. I can hear you. So apologies, I don't know. Uh, I'm, on, I, I'm actually driven through a rainstorm. We've been camping off the grid for the last few days. So I, I was listening to all the other talks successfully and sorry for the technical problems here. Let me cut to the chase since we are um, challenged by uh, having so many wonderful talks. My wife and I started three public intergenerational schools where urban city children from Cleveland and the Cleveland environment go to school with older adults, some of whom have memory challenges. It's relationship-based, it's narrative-based, it's health-based. We've done work on lead poisoning because as I, you may have heard, the last thing I said before I broke, uh, broke off the connection was I'm a prevention-oriented geriatric neurologist. I am concerned not about the future, not about the future of children, but about the future of our children as our future elders, extending the seven generations thinking. In our school, we work on health, school-based healthcare. We've worked on lead poisoning. Uh, we also have uh, tried to celebrate activism. We did a project where our elders who had saved our nature center some uh, in the 1960s from a highway being put through it, that the kids would interview those elders to learn how they took care of their natural and, and, and human community some 50 years ago. So for us, it's all about uh, relationships and stories, and it's all about um, regenerate, regenerating health broadly defined. It's not just the health of the body, it's not just the health of the community, social community, it's the health of the natural community. And I, frank, quite frankly, I think the crisis we're in uh, uh, that we've been talking about, um, and that people would agree, it's a spiritual crisis. It's a, it's a, we need to regenerate consciousness in ways that mod, the modern world have robbed us of, of, being, uh, of, of being able to celebrate. So uh, I, I, uh, I celebrate the diversity of having a geriatric neurologist with uh, two other people uh, who have been talking so profoundly about uh, the care of uh, mothers and children but it'll take um, these diverse points of view. It'll take the relationships which is between generations, in our opinion, to uh, help us come through this huge crisis that we're facing. So again, thank you for allowing me to listen and participate. And I hope these comments um, have been 
received at all, <laughs> let alone well received. Thank you, Stephanie, again for having me. And uh, my apologies for my location here in a rainstorm on the side of a highway. Uh, no apologies, no apologies necessary, Peter. Peter is also a great friend and advisor to climate change and consciousness and makes an incredible contribution, uh, particularly in his understanding of brain function uh, in the uh, final act of our lives, uh, which I inhabit. Uh, and I am grateful that the research that he does is a benefit in inspiring the kind of resilience and neuroplasticity that I gratefully embody every day with enormous gratitude. I am going to briefly be a voice for neurodiversity, for our neurodiverse children. I'm, I'm referencing my research, uh, my book, New Frontiers in Sensory Integration, which grew out of another book, They Were Families, How War Comes Home. So this is my clinically tested peer-reviewed research that revealed to me that the children of veterans who had experienced combat shock were 80% more likely to be neurodiverse on the autistic spectrum or have some other neurodiverse sensory integration difficulties than the general population. And that led me to an understanding of neurodiversity and quoting from language that Allison used, I will be able to encapsulate my discoveries, I think, with the phrase that she pointed me to, the shock of severance, the shock of severance and how our children are through their sensory mechanisms trying to sort what we have not sorted. In my work with neurodiverse families, I learned the most about neurodiversity from the children and frequently from the parents who were able to follow the rhythms and the messages that their children provided for them. That capacity to learn from the children and for the parents who in the best of cases had the humility to look at how their own sensory mechanisms were distorted and unsorted and disorganized and attend to that first, liberated their children into the brilliance that they had embodied to deliver. Otherwise those children were ridiculed, ostracized, made fun of, alienated. I am not saying any of this to create any guilt or shame. I am seeing it as encouragement and coming back to where I started, that we are the adults in the room and our responsibility to the children in our lives, the children of the future. And when I say children, I mean all children everywhere is to sort through our own distress and grow up and act as Ibu Robin Lim demonstrates. To come through our own sensory disorganization into a grounded, rooted relationship to the earth and be anchors for our children, for children everywhere, for the children of the future. It's a highly condensed version. I'm happy to deliver more to those of you who would like to discover how you can attune, how you can follow, how you can be a leader, an unprecedented leader in your community, regardless of your background. I invite you to 
visit climate change and consciousness, the TAR approach for the resolution of shock and trauma. We are collaborators with Humanity Rising and Ubiquity University. This summit in sum is dedicated to children everywhere and to the children of the future. I want to thank all the panelists from this entire week. I wanna thank Ibu Robin Lim for staying up into the night and delivering the reality to us. Alison Davis for her research and her service and for being an eco-feminist. Dr. Peter Whitehouse for being a tree, a rooted source of shelter for elders as well as families. And I want to thank Georg for his backup and Jim Garrison for being the man that he is, his beautiful apology yesterday to the Latinas, mis hermanas. Over to you, Jim, thank you. Thank you, Stephanie, uh, Peter, Allison, uh, and most especially uh, to Ibu Robin. Uh, Robin, your slides and your stories today were extraordinary. It was, it was so powerful because, you know, we hear in the news, you know, an earthquake or a tsunami, and we hear bits and pieces of carnage. And uh, then a month or two later, some kind of um, uh, international relief, but we don't get behind those headlines very often. And what you did today uh, for all of us, I think, is not only to humanize uh, these calamities, but to show how mothers and children are being cared for in exquisitely compassionate and tender ways. And I'm sure, Allison, if we'd had more time with you, and I hope we can uh, down the road, uh, we would have heard uh, similar uh, stories. But I just want to acknowledge, uh, Stephanie, uh, the work that um, uh, Robin is doing there uh, in East Asia, and uh, to say that it, it really brought home both the agony and the ecstasy of what it means to be human uh, in our time and the deep, tender, loving care that is so essential, not only in the birth process, uh, but also uh, as all of us suffer calamities of one kind or another, uh, which are increasingly frequent in our world. Uh, and the instinctive response is to be afraid to contract. And you gave us a model, a Robin, of, of a counterintuitive love without boundary. So I just want to acknowledge that. And, and I think that's a beautiful tonality with which to close our five-day program on just how important love is to the vulnerable and how important love is uh, to those of us uh, who so deeply care about uh, creating together a better world. Uh, so that brings our five-day program to a close. Uh, Stephanie, I want to thank you very deeply for convening this session. We uh, we'll have um, further news about uh, Stephanie's uh, courses and various other programs that she's uh, interested in, in convening uh, for Humanity Rising. Have a good weekend, everyone. And then when we come back on Monday, we're going to begin a five-day program on our endangered world uh, with Tom Eddington, uh, who is the founder of Endangered Global. So that's Monday through next Friday here on Humanity Rising. You're all welcome to the after chat session. Enjoy your weekend. Uh, you'll see the link to the after chat in the uh, chat box. And uh, I now uh, bid you goodbye. Thank you so much.